record to the cloud. Okay, here we are on episode 10. It's like double digit. I feel like we should celebrate. Perhaps I will. Probably, probably I will. Woo! <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so today I'm going to start with the quote of the day instead of ending my little rant, rantro. Rantro, that's my new word. Okay. Oh, anyway. love it. Rantro. 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 So <laughs> the quote for the day comes from Sadhguru. And it is, so only when you do not know yourself, the opinions of others become important. So really it's about what you think, what you believe, what really, really, really matters to you that becomes important. And I think this is really relevant in our topic today because today we're talking about pricing, we're talking about money, we're talking about the financial goals that you have. And really the only person that this should matter to is, to is you. You know, when we talk about pricing, how much money it is it that you actually want, that you actually need for the lifestyle that's relevant to you, not what the world is telling you should, you should have, but what really matters to you. And we're actually going to share, or Patty's going to share um, in the show today about the three most common numbers that we hear, and you might actually be surprised at what they are. And the next thing is when we talk often about charging, what's the price that's most comfortable for you? right? It all this all goes back to what really matters to you. You know, what are you comfortable with? What do you want to do? And it can change, right? We love those permission slips. We give you a permission slip to change your mind as things progress. It's totally fine. And then next week, we're actually going to be talking about beliefs. So I thought this topic today is a really, really good one because anytime money comes up, we can really look at, ah, oh, what am I believing right now about money, about pricing, about my customers, about what I'm worth. So as we go through this today, I really encourage you to start thinking about what beliefs are showing up for you today and maybe write them down so that next week when we dive into this a little bit more, into the belief things, you'll have some things that we can actually look at and discuss. And speaking of next week, next week our show is going to look like this. Monday, um, I will be sharing with you the three C's of the effective sales conversation. Tuesday, we're going to look at guarantees. So the ins and outs of guarantees. Often we think of a guarantee as just, you know, 30 day money back, but there's lots of different factors in a guarantee and even how you can use your guarantee to help you take action. And then Wednesday, we're going to dive into that belief topic. Thursday, we have a special guest, another interview. Uh, with Andrea and Joanna, and they're from a company called, I can never say this right, Cuero Mundo, Carrito Mundo. Um, and they are a travel company that does travel to Latin America. And we're going to talk to them about what they're doing right now that's had a really great impact on their business. So in this time when planes aren't moving, what are they doing and how have they seen actually a really positive thing happening in their business? Friday is Good Friday, so we won't be live, but that's when we're going to drop the Kevin Knebel interview for you. So you'll actually be able to see that, watch that, see why we think he's so great, get some little nuggets, um, and that'll take us through next week. So with that, let's talk about money. I was going to have a song and I just lost it, so let's just talk about money. <laughs> Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about money. Uh, that's our topic today. We're going to talk about pricing. We're going to talk about money. We're going to talk about financial goals, about pricing, about value. Um, this is about numbers and about math, and uh, which is very, very exciting for some people. Uh, some of us like math. I like math. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> to start, it off, start us off, uh, the, uh, the permission slip. Uh, that whatever your financial goals are, uh, they're your goals and they're just fine. Uh, we see a lot of kind of shaming around fa financial goals. And we've had, and we'll talk about this in just a moment, but uh, we get a lot of messaging around uh, financial goals and how much, you know, charging what we're worth. And there's a lot of messaging that uh, sometimes comes across as a should or a shaming or whatever and we're like your financial goals are your financial goals whatever they are they're okie dokie um, with us um, 
you know, you don't, you don't need judgment around that. Uh, but we, here's your permission slip to say, my financial goals are my financial goals and they're just fine. Uh, also giving you permission to charge whatever you want to charge. Um, to kind of shut out the voices of uh, the gurus and the uh, the recommendations, including ours, if you don't like what we have to say, uh, charge what you like, your business, your life, your decisions. That said, we have opinions. Uh, we have things to share. Uh, so we'll dive into that. But keeping in mind, it's a okay, whatever you want. The van of pricing. <laughs> There are three factors that go into determining the right price for you and for your business. And your right price lives at the intersection of these three things. The first one being, um, if I can find my clicker here, yeah. The first one being that your price works for your business and it works for your financial goals. This is the pure mathematical kind of uh, look at it. And I'll show you some examples in a moment. The second factor is your clients. They, um, when we looked at uh, the Ven of ideal clients, they uh, are willing to pay, ready, willing, and able to pay what you're asking. So your price needs to work for your business, money-wise, has to work for your clients in terms of value. We'll talk about that. And it has to work for you. You have to feel good about it. it goes back to what Georgie was saying earlier. Um, your price is part of your business. You need to feel confident in it and uh, comfortable when you talk about it. So we're going to dive into each one of these areas, take a look a little closer. Beginning with the question. This is the question that Georgie, um, before Georgie and I started working together, we were working separately. <laughs> How about that for revelation? Uh, however, we both had this same question that we asked our clients. How much money do you want to make? It, it's kind of a basic sales and marketing, business coaching kind of a place to begin with with people is, you know, what are your goals? What are, what are we aiming at here? And how much money do you want to make? And I was chatting with Georgie the other day about the, the common answers because there wasn't a whole lot of variation. If I was to make it like a chart or a table about what people were asking, three prices, you know, three goals came up and in a specific order and surprise, surprise, Georgie got the same responses when she um, asked her clients these questions. So we're thinking, okay, this is starting to look like a, like a substantial set of data here about what people are asking for. And those numbers, because I'm sure you're curious, the number one most popular is this is like, this is like, uh, what's that show? Family Feud, where they uh, uh, unveil the number one answer is $100,000 a year. Most common, number one answer, $100,000 a year, $10,000 a month, typically in there. You're wondering where the, where the name of the program 10K came from? That's what it came from, is the number one financial goal that the people we talk to have. I want to make $10,000 a month or $100,000 a year. That's the number one most popular answer. Doesn't mean it's right. It's just if that happens to be your number, you happen to be in the majority. Uh, and if your number is different, that's fine too. Second most popular number, and this one might be the surprise, $3,000 a month. Uh, and very like 100,000 a year won by a slim margin, uh, $3,000 a month, incredibly. Uh, popular answer. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, we work with a lot of people who do um, wellness kind of practices, uh, coaching, life coaching, that kind of thing. And despite what uh, coaching school might tell you <laughs> and about all the claims about how much gazillions of dollars coaches make, I think I saw some stats a while back that said the actual average for like self-employed coaches was somewhere around $18,000 a year. Um, so $3,000 a month, uh, whether that's a supplement to money that you have, the equivalent of a kind of a, a, a regular sort of a job, uh, but $3,000 a month, very popular answer. And a lot of times when they give this answer, there's this feeling of, of uh, shame that I'm not asking for very much and the make lots of money gurus kind of laugh at me. They may have had um, a previous coach that responded in a negative way to that number. Thus the permission slip. If this is your number or if it's lower or if it's in that smaller range, A-OK. -okay. We talked about this way at the beginning of the series uh, 
uh, somebody commented that, you know, it's nice to um, hear that you don't have to make some great big huge business or have huge financial goals. It's totally okay to work on a smaller scale. And uh, we're 100% in support of that. So a relatively small number, second most. Um, the third most is the higher, kind of like the ceiling, the highest uh, number that we get. And it's 250. Oh, 250 a year. I only once ever had somebody say they wanted to make a million dollars a year. And when we talked about it a little bit, um, and they kind of got a sense of what that actually looked like, they backed it down to 100,000 a year. <laughs> because when you actually think about it, um, you know, a lot of times when you see these programs for make seven figures, scale your business, make a million dollars a year, it's a very different business model than working one-on-one -on -one with clients. What they're talking about in those programs, they often have people working for them. They spend a lot, a lot of money on advertising. Um, and that seven figures doesn't necessarily go into your pocket. Whereas when we talk about professional services, there's not a lot of expense involved with it. And a good chunk of the revenue is, is actually equivalent to what you take home. So those are the three most popular numbers. So we're going to break that down into what that looks like in terms of pricing, because a lot of times we have these kind of vague notions of what that money um, is and what we need to charge. So I did some math for you based on those things. So looking at those numbers where we've got them, you know, per year or per month, let's break this down into per month, $100,000 a year, roughly $10,000 a month, $8,333. Um, but We'll go with 10,000 here because we like round numbers. Um, $3,000 a month is $3,000 a month. And for 250, roughly 20,000, 21,000, something like that. Uh, you know, 20,000 a month is 240 a year. So somewhere in there. That's what the month looks like. And we're going to break that down into an hourly rate just so that you have an idea of what that looks like per hour. And we base this on 20 hours of paid client time per week because 40 and a lot of people do this they do the calculation at 40 hours a week and that doesn't leave any time for sales and marketing and administration and customer service and all that kind of stuff that you do so if you can get paid for roughly half your time half your time doing client facing work where you get paid half your time doing the business stuff where you don't get directly paid uh, then that's that's a nice gauge to look at i also calculated this based on four weeks per month which is 48 weeks per year, which gives you four weeks off for, uh, for vacation, which is kind of nice too. So $10,000 um, per month on this calculation is $125 an hour. And it's just a nice little gauge for basing your pricing and your packages on if you can get $125 an hour, get 20 client hours per week, you can make $10,000 per month. That's what it looks like. When we look at three thousand dollars, it's actually thirty-seven fifty, but I bumped it up to forty. <laughs> okay, and for twenty thousand, two hundred fifty an hour. Now, I'm thinking that for some people who maybe haven't taken a spreadsheet or a calculator to this sort of thing, maybe just a little bit surprised that those hourly rates uh, don't look all that screaming high. Uh, in order to make this kind of money. I've also looked at this in terms of, you know, most popular answers or ways of working or ways of packaging services at, at you know, six hours or 12 hours, six session, 12 session, six hours, 12 hours kind of packages, very popular. Six session package at this price is $750. That's very reasonable kind of a package price, uh, appealing. Uh, 250 240 bucks <laughs> and like even just looking at these numbers it's like if you're in this wanting three thousand dollars a month kind of range you probably want to look at higher prices than this because these ones feel a little bit low uh, as a client uh, 1500 for this twenty thousand dollar business look at a 12 session package you doubling that amount 1500 bucks for 12 sessions um 500 bucks roughly for 12 sessions here, uh, $3,000 for 12 sessions here. This is not sky high luxury pricing. Uh, you don't have to charge uh, super high premium prices in order to make those kind of financial goals. And if your goals are different from this, you, you know, you can work it out in a calculator. If you want a spreadsheet for it, send me an email. I'll send you a spreadsheet. I got a spreadsheet, a nifty spreadsheet that will do all this calculation for you. Um, if you'd like that, uh, send me an email. I'll send it to you. 
Um, but this, this is the business stuff. This is the numbers. Easy to figure out. They're just numbers. It's data. I love this part. <laughs> The answers are obvious. <laughs> there's nothing, there's nothing touchy feely about this kind of stuff. It's just, yeah, they're numbers. This is what they look like. And these are, these are kind of the, uh, the, uh, the floor price, not the ceiling. You don't want to, you don't want to drop too far below this based on your goals. You might want to adjust your goals when you're starting out 250 a year, uh, maybe a pretty high goal for somebody in a level one business that's just getting started. You might want to, uh, look at uh, growing a little bit more slowly than that. But if these are your goals, this is what your pricing needs to look like just from a purely mathematical uh, perspective. And of course, if you charge more, you can work less. That's kind of the trade off here with this. So that's, that's the right for your business thing, pure math, easy to figure out. The next piece is the right for your client piece. And when your client is making a decision about buying something, they're basically making a waiting decision. It's, it's like on one hand, they've got the cash that you're asking for. And on the other, they have um, the service that you're providing. They need, to pro they need to value what you are offering at a higher amount than the cash they're spending. That's kind of the logical decision that's happening in their mind. Is this thing that I'm considering buying worth this stack of money? That's the question that they are asking. And it is your job as the salesperson, as the marketer, to make that value clear to them. And this is where people get tripped up. Because if your client doesn't understand what it is that you're selling, like nobody wants to exchange money for something as conceptual as sessions or hours or some kind of information or process or tip or technique or modality that they're not familiar with and they've never heard of before and they have to think about how that will benefit them. This is the job of the sales and marketing right here is to make it super clear to your client that what you're doing is worth more to them than the money you're charging. This is the key to everything. Uh, and if you don't have this part right, you're going to run into frustrations. You're going to run into places where you know that somebody needs your service, but they're not buying or they balk at your price or they don't understand what it is that it'll do, do for them. And this is where this falls down. And this is where sales and marketing comes in. This, it, it solves for this problem of conveying the value of what you, um, of what you offer. And if you look at um, the messaging, Venn diagram of messaging, where you talk about your work and the client, that overlap is where the value is. And this is where you match up what they're looking for, their problems, their desires with what you're selling. Because they're not buying sessions, they're not buying hours, they're not buying some bizarre thing they've never heard of before. They're buying a solution to a problem they have, or they're buying assistance, getting something that they want. And this is, uh, this is where you need to focus to be effective here. So this is, that's their decision. Third piece is you. <laughs> Your price has to feel right for you. Now, when Georgie and I work with clients, we do uh, role playing of sales conversations. So uh, Georgie sets people up with the structure of the conversation, what to say, when to say it, when to ask for the price. Then we get on a call and I pretend to be a prospective client and a client gets to run through the sales conversation. And it's been really interesting. People get tripped up at different places, but the most popular place to get tripped up is naming the price. And I've been involved in some extremely confident, competent, professional uh, sales conversations where the train goes right off the track when it comes time to name the price, to present an offer and to say how much it charges. And it, it goes from a discomfort, a little wiggle, like there's, there's, there's tells, there's signs that there's discomfort uh, with what people are saying. And sometimes the sheer kind of, oh, I can't say it. Um, so there's this awkwardness with price. Uh, this is something that you need to, to get um, solid with. This goes right back to what Georgie was saying at the beginning of the session, is that you need to be really, really comfortable with your price. And a lot of times this discomfort comes from taking in a lot of information 
that talks about you need to charge what you're worth, you need to charge at high ticket prices, that people don't value you unless you charge high prices. People who say things like, uh, it's easier to charge high prices than low prices, uh, premium pricing. I, I've got this really annoying ad that shows up for me when I'm on Facebook talking about uh, ch charging $100,000 for your packages, that kind of thing. Um, and this kind of luxury pricing, high ticket pricing, whatever you want to call it, is one of those things that comes with kind of expectations um, on the part of the clients. So when you when you actually take a look at the people who are promoting this, who are truly successful themselves, not people who are just parroting what somebody else told them, but the people who are really doing this. Um, you look at somebody like Tony Robbins, who gets like an enormous amount of money working for private clients. They have a reputation. They have some renown. It, it, it's they, they have a, somewhat of a celebrity-ish kind of a reputation in the field. People know of them. Uh, they have uh, really well-developed uh, packaging and marketing, and they have confidence and conviction. They've been at it for a while. Uh, they have testimonials, really good testimonials. They have all of this stuff dialed in. Like They have it um, running really, really, really well. This is level, like they are solid level two, level three kind of level businesses. These are not people that are new and starting out. Every once in a while you, you, you get somebody who says, oh yeah, you know, I was just like the ink wasn't even dry on my certi coaching certificate and I was charging $10,000 a minute for my services or whatever. Um, this is not the typical situation. So when you're getting this advice, when people are saying, oh, you need to charge really high prices and they say it's just as easy or it's easier, that may be very, very true for them. It's easier to charge higher prices when your calendar is full and you don't need a client. It's easier to charge higher prices when you've been doing the work for years, you know what kind of results you get for people and you are confident and convinced in that conversation with them and you can sit across the table from somebody or on a Zoom call or phone call with someone and they can lay out their problem and you say, you know what, this is exactly what I help with. I, I've got a system, it works, I guarantee it, it gets results. Here's a whole pile of testimonials of people who have worked with me and gotten those results. When those things are true, sure, it is easier to sell at a higher price because it wouldn't be believable at a low price. Uh, so you have to look at the kind of the context. So if you've been told to charge sky high prices, but you do this one when you have uh, a conversation with people, uh, that might be something for you to reconsider. And um, this is this is where it comes down into your imagination and your your vision board. And you can write goals and affirmations saying that. I charge $10,000 an hour for my coaching and my clients gladly pay for it. You can put, you know, yachts on your vision board and you can have this imaginary conversation where it's like, no problem. I can ask for that price. And if I get anything less than $1,500 an hour, I'm going to resent it. Not worth getting out of bed for, as uh, some of those people say. Uh, you might have that in your imagination, uh, but it's a little like roller coasters. You might look at one and have kind of an idea of what that might be like, but actually getting on that roller coaster is a very different felt experience. And it's the same thing with imaginary um, stuff in your head and actually getting face to face with an actual prospective client. You get to that point in the conversation where you have to tell them that, uh, that your fee is $10,000 an hour or whatever uh, price you dreamed up in your head. Um, you may not be able to say that with conviction. So our advice should you choose to take it uh, is to grow into this, especially if you're, you're newer, uh, easier to raise prices than lower them. Take a look at, at those charts about what what it looks you know what um what you actually need to make and consider what would a package or pricing look like on the lower end and ha have that felt sense of what resentment level pricing is and when i say resentment level pricing it's that feeling where it's like they are getting way more out of this than what i'm charging for and this is not an imaginary exercise this is a felt sense 
and you will feel it. And it becomes this, this place where it's like, you don't even want to make an offer because you don't want to do the work, not for what you're asking. That is a clear signal that it's time to raise your price. You know, you need to feel good about that transaction. But for a lot of people starting out, a lower price feels just fine. Uh, there's this phase that we go through in business where we get ridiculously excited about small amounts of money. Yeah, the first sale I made in my business was 300 bucks. It was just like, <laughs> if I didn't need the 300 bucks, I would have put that check in a frame, you know, put it on my office wall. There's reason, you know, <laughs> you see that, you know, the first dollar I ever made uh, framed, it's a big deal. Um, and, and it's great for practicing at lower prices too. The conversations are easier. You're not trying to justify a higher price. And when you feel more comfortable about your pricing, uh, you can focus on the other parts and making connections with clients and really listening without having that kind of hanging over your head. It's like, oh no, I'm gonna have to name a price. Oh no, I'm gonna have to name a price. And it, it becomes easier uh, when you lower the bar for yourself and then you can just grow into it. You, you know, do the, do the first one for a lower price, then you know, raise it gradually and grow into that, um, into those higher pricing levels. Uh, that's kind of the um, bit of advice coming your direction um, for this. And it's with so that, true. Questions? You know, it's so true. I can think about, you know, when I first started doing um, the Y Discovery workshops, because I was so excited about doing them, but I wasn't confident in my ability to do it. So literally, I would do the one day workshop for $47, $47. Cause you know, then it went up to $67. Then I was doing three days for $99, <laughs> you know? So I wanted to have more content. I was getting more confident, you know? And then I was like, all right, I got this. I get, I can get results. This is awesome. Then it was $1,500 for the workshop and $3,500 if you want me to do it with you one-on-one. -on -one, right. But it comes with that comfortability. Like I'm, I don't think I could have, I couldn't have said $1,500 when I very first started doing it. It would have been like, oh, I would have been that person. Oh my God, I can't do it. Right. So I think it's such a true process that I think we all go through, but nobody talks about it. Nobody says, oh, that's okay. And then we kind of feel bad because why can't I say $1,000, $1,500, whatever it is that, that, that we're, we're charging. So, you know, goes back to what feels good for you. And that, that space of, what's right for me now and am I just avoiding or what really truly is the truth for me right now and I think when you're grounded in what's true for you you're okay with hearing all the yabber from other places right you just you do you do you your u-shaped business <laughs> as my friend would say <laughs> any questions thoughts this is money no one can see you, so it's the perfect spot to ask your questions. <laughs> we won't even use your name if you have a question. <laughs> we promise. <laughs> so much um, often comes up about money, and it is one of those topics that we, you know, we just don't, we just don't want to talk about. It's like, no. Well, what will people, what will people think if I'm, if I only want three thousand dollars a month? Yeah. Like. <laughs> And we're just like, talk about um, being the lone, uh, the lone voices in the wilderness that talk about, oh, you don't have to charge high prices. <laughs> you don't have to have huge, huge uh, financial goals. It's like, I often look at things like, um, what's the, what's the median income uh, in the geographic area that you live in? And it's like, I think Vancouver's is like not even livable. It's something like $80,000 for a family or something like that. It's like, it's not even livable, but it's still under a hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. You know, and part of it, it, it you know, it, it's matching what you're offering to what your, um, uh, what your, what your clients are uh, accustomed to paying. And, you know, it's like, okay, what's kind of the average in, in, um, in this industry. Um, and you were saying something really good about that uh, before we got on this call, Georgie. About um, uh, about uh, massage therapists and physiotherapists. Oh yeah, yeah. Because it, it, I think as 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 coaches, right? Like you're actually like a professional service. So when you look at um, like massage therapists, um, chiropractors, personal trainers, those kinds of things, their fees are anywhere from 
I would say $85 an hour and up, you know? And I think, so be offering, you know, coaching, it's a professional service. And often I think we, for some reason, we, we don't link ourselves into that area. We think it's something different or weird or something, you know, but you are offering a professional service and it's just, where are you in that spectrum that you feel comfortable with, with the, you know, the experience you have, the results you've gotten, those kinds of things. And here's the thing. It doesn't mean you have, if you start at a lower end, it like maybe you do two clients at a lower package price. And after though, you're like, yeah, no, nope, it's just going up. Great. You don't have to keep that like low end pricing for a year for six months. Literally it could be, you could do it twice. You could do it once and be like, I'm good. Nope. I, I think I realize like there's no set time limit for things like that. You know, it's, it's, it's your thing, you know, and I think that's one of the biggest things is, and we were talking about this the other day too, is, is how do we help people start to trust themselves more, you know, really, really be able to tap in because ultimately, you know, what's right for you. It's just tuning out a lot of that information. Yeah. And, and, and also sloughing off the pressure as much as possible. Uh, There's a lot of messaging out there that says, oh, it's quick and easy and just, uh, you know, it should be no problem to go out there and charge high prices and have these really slick enrollment conversations and stuff like that. Um, But for people who really care about the quality of work that they do and about delivering a result, it puts an extreme amount of pressure to say, okay, now I have this thing and I have to be worth uh, $20,000 to match my pricing and I'm kind of new at this and I'm not really sure I can do that. And what is that expectation going to look like? And that's the kind of stuff that often gets in the way of uh, trying to do anything for your business. Like you, you can get totally stuck with something like that, with a belief that you need to charge a certain amount of money that goes away when you drop the price down to something that you feel is reasonable. Exactly. Okay, let's go through our chat. Great advice. This is what I've been struggling with. Part of the problem getting sales was not being comfortable with high prices that had been recommended. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, My truth is that I don't have to work. I want to work. Being reminded that I don't have to go for a seven-figure business takes off so much stress because I don't want to do the work that is required to reach those numbers. Perfect. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. In my industry, which is first day training, I feel very restricted by the small price range of the prices charged by my competitors. It's frustrating that the other first aid agencies charge such low prices compared to the other type of training, like computer training, et cetera. What to do? That is a really great question. And this comes down to, and it's it's true for other businesses too, um, where there's kind of a, kind of a standard rate that's charged. Um, it wouldn't officially be a standard rate, but you know, if you, go, if you phone around to your competitors, you'll find that they all uh, charge roughly the same kind of fees. And it comes down to, um, it's a little bit of a, being seen as a commodity. Because if it doesn't matter if they get this service from you versus getting this service from Uh, somebody else like if they're just seeing it as as uh, checking a box kind of thing that's part of where um uh, of where the issue comes up they're just like okay we have to check this box we have to do this thing it doesn't matter where we buy it from so we might as well buy it from the cheapest so if your business is in that kind of a position uh you will have the limits of of pricing It, it reminds me a little bit about um people who say who who every once in a while kind of get on this bad way. It's like, go and buy from the local store, even though they charge more money for the same um, product that that Walmart charges, keep your local business and business kind of thing. Um, If what you're selling is just a commodity, if it's just a widget and I can get the widget cheaper at Acme widgets, it's like, that's where people tend to go. Is that, is that um, the choice of price? So a couple of things you can do here. Um, One would be, how can you add additional value? How can you uh, provide something above and beyond uh, what they get just with getting the training? And this would 
falls into kind of uh, consulting, advising, managing, tracking, uh, something like that, that you do as a value add um, for like, you know, for businesses, I'm thinking in particular more so than individuals. Um, and how can you maybe package up the service rather than looking at it as in individual courses? What would it look like to have that on a, on a contract on a yearly basis to, to just cover all of the training for all of the people and to track what they need and uh, when they need it, that kind of a thing. Uh, that would be kind of the direction that I'd be going at. It's like, how do you put yourself in a completely different comparison? So it's like, yeah, you can, you can buy these things off the shelf here, or you can get a much higher level of, of service um, and add more value if you go over here and, it's, it, and, it, doesn't, and it doesn't compare. So it's kind of like, okay, what are the other, what are the problems that your clients are struggling with that you can solve that are adjacent to what you're offering? And I'm thinking that it's going to be in the managing tracking uh, area, keeping track of who's qualified, who's not, whose tickets is expiring, that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, creating higher level packages and uh, kind of locking people in. <laughs> Exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking too. Almost like on a, a contract basis too, because you got rolling people coming up. You've got to recertify every here and then instead of just, oh, at that time I'm looking through the phone book or no phone books, I guess anymore, Google, whatever it is, <laughs> you yep. know, but, but being able to provide, you're solving the, the problem of them having to take the time to do that too. Yeah. Right. Which goes back to what are your client's problems and how can you solve them? Um, what else we got? Okay, this session has been extremely helpful. I've been <laughs> every time it moves, um, I've been kind of stuck on this issue decision for quite a while. Um, emphasizing one's unique aspect to your offer services can help a person get away from worrying about average standards of pricing for the business in general. Yes, uh, thank you. I will work on packaging and adding value. Yeah, it's such a good good thing. It's like how do you take yourself out of the just being the commodity, right? And that's where, that's where the you comes in too. It, 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 it know? absolutely does. It, it's, it's about the, um, uh, you know, your personality dealing with you as a human being. I was reading something about this a while back about, um, uh, a lot of purchasing decisions in larger companies are often made based on the relationship with the sales rep. They buy from that person because they like them. And like, I, if, if I'm going to like get in my little time traveling machine, go way back um, to my first <laughs> business um, back in the 1980s, I ran a video store and there were three companies that wholesaled movies that I had a choice to buy from. And I bought from Linda. I don't even know what the name of the company was was but I wasn't even entertaining anybody else and this was commodity pricing too everybody um, was selling the movies for roughly the same price but I bought from Linda because she was Linda and because I liked her and because she had good recommendations and she provided amazing service so I didn't even look at the other places and if their movies were a couple bucks cheaper or whatever I didn't notice um, like because I, I wasn't even comparing it was just like okay, every month I order movies and every month Linda comes into the store to take that order. And it's just like, that's how it works. And when the other guys came around, I'm like, no, thanks. I'm covered. <laughs> I'm not even entertaining them. They say, well, but we're cheaper. And it's like, I don't care. I got Linda. Linda's, Linda's got my back. And, and, you know, and Linda did more than just take my order. Linda advised me what to buy. And if I made a, a, like what she perceived to be a mistake, in my orders and she's like you didn't order this movie this movie is going to be popular you know you, you need to order and you need three copies might not be what you want to watch this is what people want to watch and everyone else is ordering it and you'll be sorry if you don't like she would just she'd take my order and she don't no, don't need that one you need three of these you know and she would adjust it she knew what my budget was and she would work within it to advise me the best things that i need and that service was worth so much and uh, she was selling what is technically a commodity service. So true. Yeah. So true. I you know, it wasn't even a service. I mean, it, this, this was a movie. It came in a box. It was yeah. VHS. <laughs> like, they were identical. <laughs> from her or the other two companies didn't matter. Exact same product. 
well, she provided the service, right? So then it's like, oh, that makes me feel good, right? People yeah. like to feel good. People like to feel important, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And she yeah, made and, and Hertz wasn't the biggest company and it wasn't the lower prices. Like, like her, she was, you know, the middle sized company of the three, uh, you know, the, if I remember correctly, her pricing is probably on the higher end, but I mean, we're not talking a lot, <laughs> you know, yeah. a couple of five bucks a movie or something, but it was worth it. Yeah, it's so true. I can think of when I, um, so I lived in Coquitlam and, um, my kids used to go to school in North Van, so I was driving a lot. But even after they weren't in that school, there was this little coffee shop in Lynn Valley. And they made, I love their coffee. I swear, I swear the guy just made it with love. But he was so kind. It was always so perfect. He was always, like I say, very attentive to, oh, what do you want? Oh, Georgie, how's your day going? Blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. This was before I think the coffee art was super popular. So he did the cool coffee art. I would drive from Coquitlam to North Vancouver just for a cup of coffee, even when I wasn't going there. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a Starbucks on every corner, realistically. But it's that, that it's the, it's, was him the owner and what they bring to their business. And I think it's, it's such a, it's such a really, really important piece to remember with your business because no one can copy you, nobody. Right. So what's the you that you're actually bringing that level of care, concern, your personality, how you handle people and situations, you know, instead of trying to be someone else, because your future clients fall in love with you and how you show up and no one can can copy that. Like, that's for sure. But yeah, when you think of like videos, videos, so like. Can't get much more commodity than that. No, no. But, or even, uh, uh, I had a lady that, used to, that came by and sold um, toner, you know, like for your printers and stuff like that, which I'd never, I would always just go to Staples and buy it until she came by and I was like, oh, this is great, you know, but, but she was really nice. She did exactly what you said. She would track. She pretty much kind of knew my schedule when I'd be out. She would pop by. She would bring me treats. <laughs> Clearly, I can be bought with chocolate, um, <laughs> but it, it's that extra level of, of care and service that that humans provide, right? It, it's back to being being a human. Yeah, yeah, so true, so true. <laughs> Do you want to read that one? Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, thank you. I don't think I had realized until now the importance of the relationships I have with my clients and how much they appreciate the extra service we offer. I love how you're both emphasizing the you part we need to highlight. Maybe I haven't valued myself enough in the past. I'm not going to name names. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> <laughs> the um, your level of customer service and who you are as a human being and as how you show up, uh, I'm, I'm going to chalk that up to a huge um, value and a big reason why you're as successful as you are and why people choose to work with you. And uh, if you can dial it up at all, I would go for it um, because you have uh, such a winning personality. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's you know that and that you know that high level of care about um uh, about your clients and, and and not just to sing, <laughs> single one person out but um this is true of our clients in general like we work with the most awesome people who offer a high level of service who really care they're great people and they care about their clients and that's stuff matters in a world where uh, it's all about numbers and converting and convincing and how do you shove people into a funnel and uh, in the dehumanizing language I was talking to Georgie about this the other day about you know the dehumanizing language the war metaphors I was reading a sales book a while back where they talked about your angle of attack uh, you know or looking at your your potential clients as suspects and it's like and then I start picturing the people I've actually worked with you know my clients like having them lurking around a building with blood on their hands or you know leaving fingerprints at a scene of some crime or something it's like 
how can you look at the people you're going to do business with it, with that kind of terminology and uh, with that lack of care? And this is what we're being told to do when really this humanity being yourself is such a huge attribute. Um, it, it, it's, you know, it's part of the value that you offer. Um, and for those of us that, that care about what we're doing and care about our clients, it's like, we, we need to show up. <laughs> we need to show up and we need to do that. Um, and we need to do it in that way um, instead of adopting all this um, bullshittery that we hear about. That's so, my that's my that's my little <laughs> my little rant of the day. That's your your rant row. Yeah, I guess it's kind of like almost like an outro rant. Outro, right? Your rant row. We have the intro and out intro outro rant row. <laughs> you just combine them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Be human. Like that's that's where it's at. Um, I changed my approach from the traditional male and aggressive sales approach to a more feminine and caring approach. Everything changed. I was also being more true to myself. Yeah. Yeah. It's what works for, for you and your personality and how you, how you show up, you know, th those, those are the pieces that they can't be taught and can't be duplicated. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's like magic sauce. It, it, it. And in some ways, it's really easy. It's because you can just be yourself. Yeah. It's, it's like there's a big piece of that. It's just to show up authentically. It's like, this is who I am. Take it or leave it kind of a thing. And when you come in with that, you, you don't have this um, kind of performance anxiety so much. It, it's like, this is me and I'm going to be me. And if I care about my clients, I'm going to show that. And if I'm... Um, you know, if I'm more reserved, I'm going to be more reserved. And if I'm gregarious, I'm not going to try and tone it down. And if I laugh and I giggle and we have fun on a conversation, that's what people are going to get. And it's just, you show up like that when you have that congruency. Uh, it, it becomes easier. It's, um, you know, you still need, you still need the structures. You still need yeah. the, um, the principles behind it. You still need to be client centered. You can be the nicest person in the world. People don't get what you're what you're buying you get friend zone like we talked about the other day like see you still need to to work on those kind of basic sales and marketing things but those things are not as complicated and as complex and as hard to do as as we sometimes believe it's embrace a few principles and show up as yourself and you're good <laughs> and those things are harder if you're trying to be someone you're not so not only are you trying to learn these fundamentals and these principles and implement them and you're trying to be a different person or a different character it's way more challenging at least make it a little easier on yourself by being being you <laughs> which which is going to lead into the, the beliefs thing that georgie's doing next week is needing to believe that uh, you're worthy and that yes. you are ready and that you offer value and that you are good enough. <laughs> it's a lot of beliefs in there too. It's so many. It's amazing, you know, um, how tricky those little beliefs are and how hidden they, they can be. Um, and we don't even realize that, that they're coming out all the time, all the time. Yep. And so being able to kind of start to create that awareness of, oh, oh isn't that interesting? Hmm, is that working for me? I wonder what I'm believing there that's stopping me, right? Uh, what else? I also create a statement of work for projects so that the clients truly understand what services I provide and the value I add. So the cost or estimate is more easily accepted. Yeah. Clarity. Clarity <laughs> and because. There's a thing about because. Um, I think this was actually in Cialdini's book about influence where he talked about people um, wanting to cut into line to um, get photocopies. And the people who said, excuse me, I'm going to, um, uh, can I do my copies first or whatever? The people who had a reason were, were allowed more frequently to step into line because we, like we like to know reason. We, we like to know why. We want to know why the price is what it is. 
uh, so in terms of the copiers, even people who said is something as simple as, can I go first because I need to make copies, <laughs> we're told uh, we're, we're allowed in first, more so the people who just asked if they could go first. Uh, but when you talk about like having a justification, a statement of work, like explaining what, like this is part of building up the value that you're offering. It's like, hey, this is what you're gonna get. When we work together, this is what you're gonna get. Um, this is, then this is why I'm charging what I'm charging. It, it gives the, we might make an emotional decision that we like you and we wanna work with you, but this provides that logical justification as to why the price is what it is. And then we can go, ah, oh, great, now I know why the price is what it is. I've got something, you know, depending on what, where you're selling, I've got something to justify this to, to my boss or justify it to accounting or whatever, right? Um, and so it's like, I, oh, I didn't just decide because I really like this person. I decided because based on numbers, uh, that kind of thing. <laughs> so true. So, so true. Any other questions, thoughts, comments around money, pricing, customers? life, Any, <laughs> anything before we move into the weekend. <laughs> Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Happy Saturday. Happy Monday. Happy every day. <laughs> Happy every day. What a great tagline. Right? Happy every day, man. <laughs> exactly. Oh, have another Q&A here. What if the client doesn't have a realistic budget? What if the client doesn't have a realistic budget? That's education. Uh, first of all, goes back to who are your clients? And clients are, are people who are ready, willing, and able to pay your fees. So it's a question of doesn't have a realistic budget because don't have any money, cannot pay for it, even if they bought into the idea that what you're offering um, is of service. So the thing first place to kind of check is like, are they actually a client? Do they qualify to be a client? Um, the second piece of this is maybe they do have the money. They just don't want to spend it, uh, which is probably more common. Um, beliefs again, that we sometimes believe that people don't have money. And if their budget isn't realistic, it's because they don't understand uh, what it is that, that, um, that they need and what the service entails and that's an education piece of it and that's something that needs to be covered uh during your sales conversation with them your discovery however you want to to phrase it is to to uh very clearly get clear about what they need and then to have that explanation about what that's going to entail and what those fees are going to be that's part of the part of the conversation and yes people may come in completely uninformed as to what um, what something costs and that's that falls on you to do the education there yeah and it gives you an opportunity to figure out maybe something's work of worker worker outable work outable I'm making yeah. up words again or not because I, I I'm trying to think I'm, I'm sure there's been some situations where I thought in my mind oh this sounds like a really good idea and I truly just didn't understand either the amount of work that went into something or the amount of expertise that came with it in my mind for, for whatever reason. Oh, that looks really simple. How much could it be? And I'm like, and I might've been initially, Oh, really? Wow. Hmm. Hmm. But then after more conversation and being basically educated on all the steps that go into this, the experience that comes behind it, I'm like, Oh, okay. Now I get it. You know, or, and Patty and I have talked about this before, often sometimes what helps in those situations too is when you think, oh, how hard can it be? And then you go try to do it yourself. And then you realize, oh, now I know how hard it can be. And then you come back. Yeah. <laughs> I've done that a lot too. <laughs> and, and see that, and that's kind of like that, that's often we run into this when, we, when we're looking at our side of, of what it takes. Um, and we, tend to get focused is like, don't they know how much time this is going to take or how much experience or how hard this work is to do? And I'm doing this and I'm doing that kind of goes to that statement of work kind of piece. It's like, this is what it looks like for me. Why don't they understand it? Um, and coming face to face with the truth that they really don't care. Um, they really don't care what they care is about what's in it for them and what the value is for them. So they're doing this weight thing. Exactly. And they have, 
going in, they have an idea of how much the, the, the money weight is on the one hand and compared to the service on the other. When you say unrealistic budget, they're thinking, I want this for this amount of money. This is what balance looks like to me. And you're going, uh, no, actually, you're going to have to triple what that um, what you're thinking in terms of a budget. And you're also going to want to address the value side of that equation too, as to what that is worth to the person who is buying it. Um, it's not so much, you know, it, helpful for them to know what goes into it from your perspective, where the price came from, but more relevant to their purchase decision as to what that's worth to them, um, and what that's going to do for them. Totally true. Yeah. Client-centered, client-centered, client-centered. Always. Geez, I think I've heard that a couple of times here. <laughs> I'm starting to get it. <laughs> Oh, so good. Uh, any other questions, thoughts, comments? 1031. 1031. <laughs> nope, you don't have any more. Okay. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend. Have an amazing weekend. That's right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>